Good morning, Dog Nation. I am Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented today by Breda Pest Management. We are loaded with our show today. It's Jake Fromm later on. We weren't able to speak to Jake last week. We'll have him back on the show today, and we'll tell you on the program, although some of you already know, but we'll tell you on the program why Jake wasn't able to be with us last week. Of course, it has nothing to do with football, but we'll get to that in a moment, and Jake will obviously have some great stuff to say, as he always does. Mike Griffith stops by today there as well. Reaction to hearing from Kirby Smart and some Georgia players yesterday as spring practice rolls on for UGA. Also, a couple of fun things out there as well. Georgia gets a great win last night. It was a great win and a really good time for Georgia fans uh, against Ohio State in the NIT tournament. We'll celebrate that some today. Pretty much every Georgia fan had kind of the same joke about this, which we're here for, of course. Uh, we'll get to that here coming up. And a pretty big warning out there to uh, these programs that think they've gotten over on Georgia because they've been able to flip a player from Georgia somewhere else or earn the commitment of a player that was perhaps considering Georgia. Kirby Smart gave you a stern warning about all that yesterday. We'll tell you about that and some really interesting stuff coming out of spring practice that we'll kick off with. So what do you say we get it going? It is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented by Breda Pest Management, and it begins right now. Today's episode of Dog Nation Daily is brought to you by Breda Pest Management, the official pest control of UGA Athletics. Presented by DogNation.com, this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. Here's your host, Brandon Adams. There's an old saying in football when coaches get together and they're sort of talking ball that whoever has the chalk last always wins. What this means is picture the coaching room and now they'd be like dry erase boards. But in the old days, they're like chalkboards and you got the, the offensive coach, he's drawing his stuff up, and the defensive coach says, well, listen, if you do that, and he takes the chalk from him, he says, I'm just going to do this and move my guys here. And then the offensive coach takes the chalk back and says, well, no, if you're going to do that, I'm going to do this. Basically, the, the thought is whoever has the chalk last gets to make the adjustment that kind of wins the battle on that particular play, and coaches have sort of joked that way with each other for a very long time. I, I think there's an element of truth probably to that, that speaks to the fact that football is ultimately a sport about punches and counter punches. And I think that's true both in terms of the actual plays that get called, but also the sort of overarching philosophy that guides football teams as well. And I think that when you look a little more deeply at that, one of the things that you see is, is that some things work better as a punch and some things perhaps works better as a counter punch. Let me talk about Georgia specifically here to see if we can uh, kind of make this make some sense. You know, one of the things that we've noticed about Georgia thus far this spring is the fact that we believe the Georgia identity this year has a chance to be far different than perhaps it's been in maybe any other year of the Kirby Smart era because Carson Beck is getting so much attention right now. There's a chance that Beck's the number one overall pick in next year's NFL draft. Long journey to get there, of course, over the next 12 months if that's the case, but it's certainly a realistic possibility for Beck. And because of that, we would say this Georgia team this year is perhaps defined by quarterback more so than any other in the Kirby Smart era. That might turn out to be true. But here is something that's really important to understand, that if it is true that this is a Georgia team defined by quarterback in a way others have not, that's still not the bedrock foundation for the program. That may be true for this Georgia team right now this year, and Beck's success may beget more of that kind of success in future years from future quarterbacks, but that's still not the foundation on which this program rests. To go back to the idea of punches and counter punches, the emergence of Beck or the emergence of the quarterback position just overall is for Georgia a counter punch. The main punch, the bread and butter, the the the, the main part of, of the Georgia program remains an ideal that's sort of far different from the quarterback position. It comes down to physical toughness. There is just a demand at the Georgia program for the players to play here to be tough physically and mentally. But in this particular case, we're just sort of talking about old fashioned physical toughness, the desire to get out there. And as the old coach would say, put your face on people and just really move them with your body that for Georgia, it starts with that. That's the main punch. And after that, there's all kinds of counter punches, but you better begin with that physical toughness. And I thought yesterday 
we had an interesting moment in Athens as it relates to all of that. One of the things that Kirby Smart was talking about was Micah Morris. Now, Morris met with the reporters yesterday. We'll hear something from Micah here in a moment. But in talking about Micah Morris, I, I'm, I'm left to con, I just sort of consider the way in which the Micah Morris story is a little bit of an embodiment of the sort of larger Georgia football story overall. Micah's a big-time recruit who's waited his turn and now hoping for a lot of playing time here in 2024. But as he does that, he's got a guy at his very position, left guard right now, who's kind of in a similar situation where Dylan Fairchild has probably to this point played more than Micah has, but also kind of waiting for an even bigger opportunity here this year. So you got these two guys, both of them former elite recruits, kind of fighting for playing time, and it's giving Georgia a level of depth at that position of the offensive line and a part of a larger story for the offensive line overall that makes Georgia unlike most teams in college football. Most teams don't have this level of offensive line depth. Georgia obviously does. But more than just having talented players there, they've got players with a tremendous mindset that allows Georgia to sort of separate itself from any would-be competitors or rivals or anything else. They just can't match Georgia, for the most part, in recent years anyway, in this one particular category. It's in that category of toughness. And as Kirby Smart spoke about one of his offensive linemen, Micah Morris, yesterday, all of this was, I think, to me, made abundantly clear. This is what Kirby Smart uh, said about Micah. Listen to the great description he has for the way in which Micah Morris plays football. Take a listen to this. Micah's a, a very veteran physical presence. He gives us uh, a toughness and uh, um, just a, an identity on offense of contact striking. Guys on defense know when, when Micah comes up on a double team, Micah pulls. Uh, he's coming with bad intentions, and he he's uh, he's good to have in terms of that group creating an identity. Don't you love the phrase "bad intentions"? Sounds a little bit like an action movie from the '80s or something like that. Micah Morris is bad intentions. I just, I just it, it's a great phrase, I, I think, and it also works in terms of an accurate description there as well. Because there are some players who try to be tough, there are some players who want to be tough. But in the case of Micah Morris and a lot of his Georgia teammates, they intend to be tough. They intend to do bad things on the football field. They are fully committing and expecting to go out and do just that. They have bad intentions. And so many times in recent years, Georgia opponents have not been able to match that. And Kirby Smart's description of Micah there, I think, is outstanding. Now, later on in the day yesterday, Micah Morris had a chance to be asked, hey, Kirby Smart says you play with the game with bad intentions. Uh, what does that mean from your perspective? And I thought Micah gave a great answer on that there as well. Here's Micah Morris telling all of us what Kirby Sm uh, Smart means when he says that Micah plays the game with bad intentions. Here's Micah talking about that. I like running into people, running over people. Um, I say, I mean, it's just it's just a mentality, you know. Their mouthpiece better be in because mine's in and I'm coming for you. That's about it. Once again, this is just incredible stuff. I mean, and you should go to the Dog Nation YouTube page and watch the full video from Mike. And obviously, throughout the course of the week, we'll give you a lot from Kirby, but you can see the, the full video there as well. He says, I like to run into people. I like pushing people around. Now, that's another big difference between a guy like Mike and some football players. There are a lot of football players who are willing to be physical. They are willing to go out there and be a blocker. In fact, that's a phrase we use sometimes in scouting reports. So-and-so is a willing blocker, meaning he'll, he'll do it. You know, if, if you ask him to, he'll do it. Micah's not a willing blocker. Micah wants to. Micah wants to get out there to that second level. He wants to lower that shoulder. He wants to collide with somebody. He says, your, your chin strap better be buckled up because mine is. And I am seeking this contact. It's one of the things that Micah, I, I think, would say, this, and this is what makes me me. This is, my, this is a part of my human uh, identity here, my desire to go out and collide with you as much as possible and get the better end of most of those collisions. And, of course, it's one of the things that makes Georgia, Georgia. And as a program identity, this is the kind of thing that works very well as sort of a primary punch. And you can add the counter punch of now we got quarterback play and now we got wide receiver and now we got a little bit more of the razzle dazzle, but your foundation better be the sort of physical toughness that guys like Micah Morris apparently provide that Kirby Smart and Micah both describe so accurately well. Because we all know the opposite of this when we see it. We all know the teams that perhaps took some shortcuts 
that perhaps were a little too finesse oriented, that thought they could win by being smarter or cuter or more clever or whatever else, only to find out when things really got into the sort of tough moments, they just kind of got pushed around. For instance, like the Ohio State Buckeyes. We've seen this, right? And we know how much pressure Ryan Day has felt because his main Big Ten rival, Michigan, just shoving him around all over the place. Uh, you know, coming up short against George in the Peach Bowl. And then what last year with that, you know, game against Notre Dame where they got the win. Notre Dame had, what, like nine players in the field or whatever else. But after the game, remember how much Ryan Day sort of embarrassed himself by calling out, you know, 90-year-old Lou Holtz or however old, you know, Lou Holtz is and basically just sort of begging the world to recognize they're tough because they can't display it the way that Micah Morris and guys like that so effortlessly and easily display that for UGA that if you don't have that as sort of a bedrock part of your program foundation, you end up begging for it on national TV like Ryan Day did. Do you remember when he did this? Like, I'd like to know where Lou Holtz is right now. What he said about our team, what he said about our team, I cannot believe. This is a tough team right here. We're proud to be from Ohio, and it's always been Ohio against the world, and it'll continue to be Ohio against the world. But I'll tell you what, I love those kids, and we got a tough team. It'll continue to be Ohio against the world. Like when you have to go into that sort of high register, high pitch voice to sort of make your case. Here's what I can tell you. Lou Holtz would never look in on Georgia football and say, this team's not tough. This team can't run the football. This team, this team can't shove it around an offensive line because it is self-evidently true. And then on top of that, you can add the quarterback play and you can add the fun stuff and build that on top of the foundation you have in place. But if you don't have the foundation of toughness, you end up looking like a Ryan Day sort of begging for it on national TV, and that's not a good look for anybody. Now, speaking of Ohio State, let me briefly shift gears to this just for a moment. How much fun was basketball last night? And I got to tell you, I had no idea I would ever enjoy the NIT tournament as much as I did last night. In fact, to give you an idea of how um, just sort of, you know, playing catch up I am on all of this, it was after the game was over. Like when when Georgia won the game against Ohio State, uh, I mean, I was like, hey, man, get a chance to go see Georgia now play Madison Square Garden. We'll come to find out the NIT semifinals and finals haven't been in New York for a couple of years here now. So they're not there. But they're going to play now in the uh, the gym made famous in the movie Hoosiers, Hinkle Fieldhouse, where Butler plays. How cool of a venue is that? But more importantly, yeah, you know, we just made fun of Ohio State there a little bit. How much fun was it seeing Ohio State squirming and losing again last night to Georgia? It's something they're getting very comfortable with and losing late and in a tough fashion. In fact, a lot of our golden shoes today, as you might imagine, are kind of themed around this. But I just thought Georgia fans were great last night. If you're on social media, you're – you know, probably following along on some of this there too. Really a fun game back and forth to Georgia's credit as a basketball team playing above its head here, uh, seemingly the last couple of road games at Wake at Ohio State. And the one thing we said about Georgia going into this tournament was they seem to want to be here. You know, clearly St. John's and Ole Miss, teams like that didn't want to. Uh, Georgia seems to want to keep playing, which I think says something about the bond they must feel together. And Mike White's at least accomplished that if if, if this team wants to play together. Clearly, this is no substitute for the NCAA tournament, but it's all we got right now. And beating up on a, a you know a team like Ohio State uh, was was kind of fun last night. Georgia fans, you know, kind of enjoyed that. And all of a sudden, now I'm kind of curious to see. Just, I, I'm way more into the NIT tournament than I thought I would be. And uh, doing uh, that against Ohio State last night will uh, do that for you. We'll have more on this later on the show. But uh, but fun to see Georgia getting a good win last night on Ohio State. Now advancing to the semifinals of the NIT tournament coming up at a classic venue. One of the best venues of sport in sports, and I think bar none, Hinkle Fieldhouse. So a uh, fun time to be a dog here when it comes to following basketball right now as well. My name's Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented today by Breda Pest Management. I bet our buddy Matt Breda was watching this last night and having a good time with all of that. And of course, we're glad to have you watching us here today on video across all platforms, 945, first and 15, 10 a.m. everywhere else. Radio Noon, Athens Sports Radio 960 Ref, and podcast. And so many of you continue to be so loyal when that podcast drops, drops for you right there at noon. You're right there for it, dognation.com, Spotify, Apple, everywhere else. We're just so thankful to have you doing that. Really, really thankful to have you as a part of our show. And our friends at Breda Pest Management, thankful to have them 
bringing the show to you. Georgia was not at Stegman Coliseum last night, but when it is or when the baseball team's getting a three-game sweep over Alabama there at Foley Field, all those athletic venues kept bug-free, critter-free, termite-free from our friends at Breda Pest Management, the official pest control provider of UGA Athletics. That's what Breda Pest Management is all about. Been in business since 1975, 125 employees all over our marketplace. I also kind of drive around a lot too. My kids got sports and I got things going on. I feel like when I'm driving around, I pretty much see a Breda Pest Management truck about every single time I go out somewhere. They're just always out taking care of business themselves, doing big things in our community. I love that because the success they've had has not only gotten Breda recognized as the official pest control provider of UGA Athletics, it has also, you know, created an opportunity for this to be leveraged for your benefit there as well, where you can now use the strength and the heritage of success that Breda has to make yourself some money here there as well. Put more money back in your pocket when you make the switch to Breda Pest Management. In fact, uh, just for doing that, you're going to put more money back in your pocket just for making that choice today. So find them online. It's BredaPest.com. B-R-E-D-A. That's the website. B-R-E-D-A. BredaPest.com. You can make the switch and uh, make Breda Pest Management your choice. Make them your official pest control provider there as well. Breda Pest Management, the official pest control provider of UGA Athletics. And it's, uh, of course, great to have all of you here on uh, Dog Nation Daily, presented by Breda Pest Manager here today. A couple of great guests coming up for us. It's Jake Fromm a little bit later on. Jake, not with us last week, but he will be with us here today. And we're going to have some fun with him. He's got some big news. And then uh, Mike Griffith coming up. Speaking of big news, always big news coming out of Athens. Mike's going to help us with some of that here coming up in just a moment. Prior to that, though, let's go around the doghouse here today. And, you know, one of the things that I want to talk about a little bit more is something else that Kirby Smart had to say yesterday. And Smart was talking about one of the players on the roster, but I believe the statement that Smart makes more broadly, I think, reflects on Georgia football overall. One of the guys going through Georgia spring practice the first time here right now is K.J. Bolden. K.J. obviously was a high-profile flip from Florida State to Georgia after choosing uh, uh, Florida State over Georgia in a very high-profile announcement you know, back during the fall. And... You know, in talking about K.J. and how he's doing, it sounds like K.J.'s doing really well right now. Ellis Robinson sounds like doing really well here, too. Young defensive backs making an impact. We talked about that on the show yesterday. Smart also went on to talk a little bit yesterday about the recruitment of K.J. Bolden there as well. And it doesn't take me to tell you this. The words that Smart uses while talking about K.J. Bolden also are greatly relevant in light of the Justice Terry discussion We've been having all week long about what happens when a player commits elsewhere from George's perspective, not much in terms of their overall pursuit of the player. These are strong words from smart and a star, a stern warning to anybody who thinks they're going to wrestle away a player uh, that George is after good stuff from smart about the recruiting trail. This is yesterday. Um, As far as KJ's recruitment, I I never, I don't, I don't, I don't see kids as committed to other places because I mean, they're not, they're not signed. There's no like, we, we, we recruit good football players. We evaluate every player the same, whether they're committed or not. And um, if there's interest from them and there's conversation from them and there's uh, visits where they come to your campus, then you just be very consistent. And uh, we're very consistent with KJ. The, the recruitment never stopped. Uh, and I told him that from the day he committed to the day that he came to us. We we're not going to stop recruiting because we think he's a great kid from a great family and a really, really good football player. So, He and Ellis uh, have a chance to make us much better. So if I didn't think I'd get a YouTube strike for doing this, I would have put the Jaws music underneath Kirby Smart right there. We don't think – we don't respect a player's decommitment to somewhere else. Dun, 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 dun. Because that's a warning, right? That means that Georgia is on the move and Georgia's on the prowl. And you may have the commitment, but listen, hold a – I said yesterday about – whatever, you know, it doesn't exist in the periodic table. There, you know, there is no tangible value of a commitment. There's nothing to hold in your hand when so-and-so is committed. You don't have that. And, and therefore, Kirby Smart says, we're not a respecter of commitments. That's not a signature. That's not a letter of intent. We're not going to respect commitments. We don't view a player as committed because it doesn't mean anything. We're going to go after that player uh, the same way we uh, would if he was uncommitted. And that was true in the case of K.J. Bolden. George ended up winning that commitment. That's going to be true in the case of Justice Terry. And a lot of people believe that Georgia may eventually once again win that commitment. 
that Georgia doesn't slow down, that a commitment doesn't change anything about the way in which Georgia pursues. In fact, if you want to use the K.J. Bolden example that Kirby Smart was talking about there, you know, we addressed that online chatter at the time that uh, there was talk and communication between the Bolden camp and Georgia, like right after the, you know, announcement for Florida State. And, and, and basically, you know, things continue the same way they always would. Uh, fairly obvious that Bolden was going to be looking to attend games, or at least a game at Georgia that fall. And that's exactly how it played out. And for Georgia, who had leaned on its relationship with KJ as long as it had, uh, obviously that ultimately became a, a really winning formula to get, actually get the recruitment and the signature from KJ Bolden there too. And once again, in the case of Justice Terry, the same process could play out. No guarantee that the result will be the same thing again. But in terms of Georgia's actions, of course they're going to be the same. And my last sort of point on all of this is, that's an important thing I think for Georgia fans to also remember there too, is that when you hear Kirby Smart talk about these sort of things, Kirby Smart does not get his feelings hurt very easily. Uh, So-and-so chose somebody else. There's always going to be a pocket of Georgia fans, and I'm not picking on these fans. It's just sort of a natural behavior perhaps. But when so-and-so picks somebody else, I don't want him. Listen, I I only want to talk about guys who want to be at Georgia. I don't want to hear about this guy ever again. That's not how Kirby Smart approaches this kind of stuff, that a commitment elsewhere is just one step along a very long journey that very, very frequently results in those players coming back to Georgia. because Georgia does not give up easily. K.J. Bolden didn't give up. Eventually, they were the winners. Justice Terry, they're not going to give up on him either. Who knows how it plays out, but we know full well how Georgia's going to pursue it the rest of the way, just as hard as they always do, and that is around the doghouse. Here today on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Breda Pass Manager. Okay, before we're done, there is some very funny stuff out there today of a former Florida player taking a jab at those lousy, stinking gators. And on a show like this, we are not complicated people. Content like that will always make the program around here. Jake Fromm joins us. We're always thrilled to have him as a part of the discussion there, too. A lot to get into with Jake here coming up. But prior to that, everything going on in Athens, the good, the bad, everything in between, as Georgia spring practice rolls on, let's cover all of that right now. Mike Griffith's day here on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Breda Pest Management. From Athens and across the SEC or wherever the recruiting trail may lead, here's a DogNation.com insight. Say hello to Mike Griffith here, Dog Nation Daily, presented by Breda Pest Management. A lot going on UGA spring practice, a lot of it good. The Less good stuff. Let's get that out of the way. Trevor Etienne. We're probably kind of talked on the ETN front now. Uh, we've had a couple of days to digest all of this, but we did hear from Kirby Smart on this yesterday, and uh, obviously Kirby pretty, I think, willing to defend ETN the person, although certainly critical of the actions, as we would all understand why he would be. Uh, Mike, as a way of kind of putting a bow on this topic for us, what did you make of what Kirby had to say about ETN yesterday? Yeah, Brandon, I think it's, um, you know, obviously this is an isolated incident from a guy that has made so many inroads that that he's become a team leader. He's genuinely well-liked and accepted by all of his teammates. Uh, he's had a fantastic offseason, and I think a lot of Georgia's hopes ride on the shoulders of ETN. I think Carson Beck needs this guy. I think Georgia needs ETN to pan out uh, to win an SEC championship and to have success in the playoff. I think this is your... This is your new Brock Bowers. This is your home run hitter. This is your go-to guy. Uh, This is the difference maker. Uh, A lot invested in ETN, and ETN has invested a lot in Georgia. Now, you know, my takeaway, and and Kirby didn't go too far down this road, but, you know, Brandon, you know, the kid's 19 years old. He's driving a car that goes 0 to 60 in three seconds. Uh, $145,000, $150,000. Uh, Audi A6 RS7 model. I mean, th- th- this NIL has brought some unintended consequences. Now, look, you you mix a late night and alcohol uh, and a teenager and a, and a high performance elite sports car, and bad things are going to happen. Um, this was a bad lapse in judgment uh, by ETN. Um, I know his older brother uh, calls and checks on him. He's talked about that. Um, you know, this is something for the ETN family to you know, really kind of wrap their brain around and ask questions about. I mean, is, is he still going to be driving that car around Athens? Is he going to be getting uh, the van ride around campus like some of the other guys that had driving infractions in the past? Kirby Smart said there would be a high price to pay for this uh, in addition to the internal policy. Then you also wonder about the school policy. Is there a chance with this being a first-time offender, is there a deferment program that would enable him to not be convicted 
and negate the potential for a one game suspension, which some people would suggest would be against Clemson. Um, and to me, that's the big question now is, um, listen, I, I don't think you're going to see ETN make another mistake like this. Everything about his character that I've learned indicates this is a, a good kid who doesn't have any history. You know, I've talked to some people in Florida. Uh, they they reaffirmed this is the one Gator that got away uh, that that Billy Napier really didn't want to lose. There were some other guys that left that that uh, I don't think really mattered as much to him. But this was the one guy they really wanted to keep. Um, you know, same thing with Georgia. When you look at the guys that have left them, you know, there's probably only one or two that Kirby really, really uh, hurt uh, for him to lose. But this is the one guy that got away from Florida. He's a good student athlete and uh, made a terrible lapse in judgment. But again, it's just another reminder that that this NIL is broke. It needs fixing. At the very least, there needs to be a morality clause. If you're going to if players are going to make a lot of money, they need to have consequences if they don't uphold the standards of that program off the field well i think the one thing that everybody can agree on is is that etn shouldn't have done what he's allegedly done right like that's the one thing that everybody can sort of agree on is that that's not what you want you want whether you live in athens on the streets or you just care about georgia football players you don't want etn or any player making that decision so we can you know kind of agree on that and i know that you and i would be on the same page on that moving forward and not to move off it too quickly but but to look at it from a football standpoint you know it sounds like you're kind of of the same mindset here. I still think that ETN has the ability to turn the page on this and be just as important a part of the uh, Georgia program as he was. And I do think on situations like this, you do read between the lines a little bit on Kirby Smart. There, there's not one part of what Smart said yesterday that was flippant or um, you know disregarding of the of the circumstance related to ETN. At the same time, it's fairly obvious they are not throwing ETN out with the bathwater here. That the, the that this is still a yeah. player that Kirby Smart has grown to have respect for and and and, and believe in. And one misstep here is not going to change that. And even if it, you know, includes not playing against Clemson, you know, Trevor et- ETN still has a chance to put a major stamp on this 2024 season for Georgia. And this, you know, you know, disappointing moment here doesn't seem to be changing that too much. Yeah, not at all. I'd count on it. Uh, Like I said, you know, Georgia needs this guy to win the SEC championship. They need this guy to win big games. This is, this is a big, this is the biggest free agent acquisition they've had uh, transfer wise. And, um, you know, he's a home run hitter. He's a thousand yard rusher. He's a guy that can get you 200 in a game. You haven't had a back like this uh, since DeAndre Swift. I mean, you know, Georgia hasn't had an all SEC back since 2019. Um, This, this, this guy's it. I'm telling you, he's an incredible talent. Um, he's a good guy uh, is, you know, reinforce that. That's what Kirby brought up yesterday. Um, it was a terrible lapse in judgment uh, and, and it is serious. Okay. I mean, this is a guy that was, I don't want to, I don't want to play that lightly, Brandon. I mean, th- you've got a family, uh, you've got kids, you've got parent, you know, you've, you've got a brother. I mean, this guy's passing on the double line at 90 miles an hour at two in the morning. That's it, with other traffic. It's, it's incredibly dangerous to the community. This is not something to take lightly. Um, we know what happened last summer. It's been well documented. Um, you know, there's a lot of innocent people out there in the community. Um, and you just can't have, uh, you know, this issue. But but I'll say this, um, you know, I had someone from out of state ask me about it. Um, you know, my ESPN friend Chris Lowe was down here yesterday and he said, what's the deal with that? And, and I said, this is kind of a thing. I mean, you know, anytime I drive back from the airport on 285, there's going to be a car that blows by me at 100 miles an hour. It's going to happen, and and it's a problem. It's not just in Athens, but it's become a problem uh, in general uh, with some of these supercharged cars and uh, more maybe lackadaisical law enforcement for whatever reason. It's not going to take this off the rails into politics, but uh, there has been some tolerance in areas that have led to some issues, and uh, Kirby Smart's put his foot down. The thing I would remind people, uh, this is the first guy that's had an issue in the offseason. This was an issue that Kirby said he would address last summer, and They've gone way out of their way to make for, on awareness, uh, on policies, and uh, I'm with you. I don't think we're going to see anything like this ever again from Trevor Etienne. Um, I think this is a lifelong lesson. He knows he's in a bubble. This has brought a lot of embarrassment and attention to a very proud family, um, a good family that really wanted to be in Georgia, and they're counting on uh, Kirby in Georgia to, to hold Trevor accountable and teach him the lessons, and And I think Trevor is, is going to continue to grind and I think he's going to be a fantastic superstar for Georgia this season. On a much happier note, I really enjoyed yesterday Kirby Smart's enthusiasm about the 2025 schedule for Georgia and the fact that, as Kirby described it, and we've on the show, 
probably described it the same way. Best home schedule Georgia's probably ever had. And, you know, listen, I think at a certain point in time, you got to get into a larger discussion about, you know, how is the SEC going to come with the agreement of what a permanent scheduling model is going to look like? And I don't know that Kirby had any great solutions for that uh, when he spoke yesterday. But in terms of kind of reflecting the overall opinion of the fan base that these are good games and a lot of fun, I was happy to hear Kirby kind of say that. We're going to do more on them show later on this week. But just uh, you were, I know, there and hearing them, what did you make of uh, Kirby's excitement about the fact that you got, you know, Bama and Texas and I guess Ole Miss, you know, coming in here in 2025? Kirby seems uh, to reflect the the feeling of fans here a little bit that those are kind of some uh, pretty cool games to have between the hedges, not this upcoming season, but the following season. Yeah, I asked him the question, Brandon, because, you know, Kirby had been at those meetings and he had championed a rotating schedule so that his program could play uh, all the different teams in the SEC over the course of four years. The goal is, you know, that a kid comes to Georgia and if he stays four years, he'll have a chance to play every team in the league um, and, and potentially in every stadium if you rotate enough games per year. Uh, so I asked him about how this has gone kind of 180 degrees from what they've been telling us at the spring meetings the last four or five years. And his attitude was, look, they gave us one of the toughest road schedules in the nation this year, Georgia. And and he wants it flipped. If he's got to go to all these places this year, which is one heck of an ask, uh, which really, you know, puts a you know dent in Georgia's championship hopes just, just from the sake of the odds. When you play that many difficult road games, it doesn't take a mathematician to figure out the odds of losing go up. Um, and so Kirby's attitude is, look, if we got to go to all these all these places, they need to come here. He said, if you don't flip it, then somebody's not going to it's not going to be fair. And it's not fair to ask Georgia, which the SEC has done uh, to play, I think, what, uh, five, four, five top 16 ESPN FPI teams next season, four of them on the road. Is that right? I mean, is that right? Think about this, Brandon. I mean, you got Clemson neutral site, but just in the SEC, what the SEC schedule is asking you to do, they're asking you to play at Alabama. They're asking you to play at Texas. They're asking you to play Ole Miss. And Tennessee is another top 15 uh, ESPN uh, FPI team. And oh, by the way, that trip to Lexington is not going to be a picnic. I, I don't know, Brandon, if I've ever seen a team with this difficult or challenging of a road SEC slate. Yeah, no, it's certainly a challenging one and getting a little bit of the the flip on that next year would be fun for fans. And then just more, more broadly too, Mike, you know, obviously I think the plan is to still have the kind of rotational schedule that you described a moment ago, but right now I think the issue facing Greg Sankey is they can't get agreement. And, you know, the point that I made is as the league gets bigger, number of teams, but also geographically wider, different kinds of teams in the SEC. Some teams want the eight-game schedule because that's how they get bowl eligible. The fourth non-conference game gives them a chance to get six wins. You know, some teams have a lot of regional rivals they want to play. Some teams the SEC don't have quite as much. You know, this is not the 10-team SEC of my childhood where everybody was pretty much in the same boat. Now it's a 16-team SEC where a lot of programs just have very, very different goals and very, very different ambitions And, you know, the days of, like, unanimous agreement on every change in the SEC, I don't know that we're ever going to get that back again because as the league gets bigger, the schools in the league just get more different. Yeah, no doubt. And, and, you know, another thing Kirby said, Brandon, I thought was really interesting was let's see how this goes. Let's see how the playoff goes because, you know, you've got that wonky. Is that a word we use on the show, wonky? Wonky is fun. yeah, wonky. You got Some of the wonky. words you use, I don't want you using it on the show, but but, won- <laughs> but wonky, you're free to use. Wonky, we got this wonky college football playoff committee, and we never know what's coming next from these cats, right? And so how are they going to look at a three-loss SEC team? How are they going to look at a two-loss SEC team? What are the seedings going to look like? Are they going to give the SEC its due and say, you know what, a three-loss Georgia is better than a one-loss NC State? Right. Because you look at who Georgia played or are are they not? Are they not going to give? So before the SEC can make their decisions, they've got to kind of see how the college football playoff committee respects the league and and what that difficulty of schedule in the league does. If you're not going to get respect for playing a tough SEC slate, then you're probably not going to evolve to a nine game schedule. 
right? But if you do get that respect, then it would make sense to say, okay, we'll take the bullet. I think the other thing that's happening right now, Brandon, is, you know, it, it appears there's a little bit of a scramble for TV dollars. And I think the SEC wants to show as much value as they possibly can right now as they renegotiate uh, their deal with ESPN. And I think that playing schedules like this, featuring the Alabamas versus the Georgias, the Georgias versus the Texas, I think these are going to be high-rating games in very key markets at a time when you're renegotiating your contract. So I think this is a very temporary thing. Uh, we know there's two more years, uh, you know, where we – see the, the uh, college football playoff model have to involve uh, the New Year's Six Bowls. And then after 2026, uh, all bets are off. So what we know is that for the next two years, we've got a 12-game schedule, and we know that the six New Year's Six games are going to be involved. After that, we don't really know. So we're in a very temporary stage right now. I think they've decided that, you know, flipping the schedule this year is probably the most fair and the most clean thing to do. But after 2025, all bets are off. And, and we really don't know what 2026 is going to hold. And mm -hmm. I think I've heard you say that before, that this is a very temporary situation. And there's something a little uneasy about that. I mean, you yeah. might as well enjoy the ride and see some good football. But uh, it's not nearly as settled um, as, as we would like at this stage. Yeah, you can't just keep rolling from one lame duck season to another. At some point in time, you got to put something more permanent in place. I, I totally agree with that. Let me finish with this, and I joked about this a little earlier. I loved – I don't know you wrote about this, dognation.com too. I thought Georgia fans were great last night on social media. Everybody just hit, really kind of got into making the most out of the NIT tournament, to be completely honest with you. I wasn't that – you know jacked up for the NIT when it was first sort of announced. I was glad George was playing, but uh, I didn't think I would care very much. And I was living and dying with this game against Ohio State last night when the Buckeyes, the opponent, it makes it a little bit easier, I guess. But Georgia fans were having a great time with this, and I was really enjoying that too. We got a bunch of golden shoes to give out later on for people who were mocking the uh, Buckeyes. Mike, how much fun was this last night? It was fun. And, and like you said, Brandon, I think it brought a lot of the football fans in um, you know, that don't maybe typically watch basketball, but you're playing Ohio State. So now you're playing a football team and now you got people's attention because Georgia and Ohio State really don't like each other. And there's a long history. Uh, you know, we've had to listen to a lot of whining and crying from Ohio State the last two years. And, and it was absolutely glorious for Georgia fans, you know, that, that their basketball team that maybe they don't even they haven't even respected that much, you know, goes up there against a hostile uh, filled up arena of fired up Ohio State fans that think they're going to get theirs against Georgia. They're a big nine point favorite over the dogs, and and Georgia wins. And they just they find a way. They they give up a 17 0 run. It's like a movie. It's almost predictable. It's like okay, at some point in the second half, they're going to give up a run, and they're going to make you think that they're going to lose, but then they're going to be heroes in the end. And and they've done that now in three games, and it's been impressive. I mean. Look, you can say that the NIT doesn't matter, but let me tell you, it matters at a school like Xavier. Xavier had never lost an NIT first round game. They were nine and zero. That's all Xavier has, Brandon. I mean, I don't know if there's, I don't even know what other sports they have. I don't think they have football, so it mattered to Xavier. And then they go to Wake Forest, and yeah, Wake Forest runs a funky offense, and I guess football matters. But look, Wake Forest is a basketball school. They got Steve Forbes. They got this awesome coach. They'd only lost one game at home all year long. It matters at Wake Forest. And that game mattered at Wake Forest. Then they play Ohio State. Ohio State beat Purdue in this. I've been to this Value City Arena. It's raucous. Columbus is a big city, man. I don't know how many people know their geography, but this is the biggest city in Ohio. This is a big deal last night. And they were ready to, to beat some Bulldogs and, you know, get some measure of therapy or revenge for the football game. And, to, and for them to miss a field goal, a, a three-point attempt, however you want to put it, to lose just like they did in the Peach Bowl was a dagger. Before I go, you're not, you're not going to have time to ask me about this. i got to throw it out, though. Spring sports right now are really happening. Your the softball team is national championship caliber. They're going to be on TV. They're going to represent. They're number three in the nation. And the baseball team, and I did hear you mention this a little earlier, you, what, what Charlie Condon's doing, and Brandon, I fully expect you to be up here with your son at some point mm -hmm. and get this guy's autograph if you haven't already. This guy is the Herschel Walker of Georgia baseball. He is amazing. Charlie Condon is one of a kind. 
once in a lifetime. This dude's unbelievable. Leads the NCAA in hit batting average, second in home runs. They're pitching around him, so now he's stealing bait. I mean, the guy's just doing everything. And just uh, and and Wes Johnson's team. We'll see what happens at Tennessee this weekend. I don't know. I don't really know how good they really are yet. They got swept at Kentucky. They sweep a top ten Alabama. They got to go to you know Tennessee. Pitching still suspect. Um, but you know the SEC is rough. But uh, both these spring sports, uh, so, so exciting. It's it's a great time. It really is an exciting time for Georgia athletics right now. Mike, really good stuff. Thanks for being here on the program today, and uh, we'll look forward to having you back here to talk plenty more in the uh, weeks to come. Have a great week. Thanks, BA. We'll see you, man. Let's take a look around the rest of the league. This is SEC Through. Yeah, a lot of fun stuff going around the uh, university here right now. And obviously, we are certainly enjoying all of it. And uh, great to hear that there as well. Something else will be great to hear coming up in a couple of minutes. Jake Fromm on the program. That's always a, a lot of fun. Prior to that, though, let's get ready to go cruising around the SEC, courtesy of Royal Caribbean. And conversations continue here uh, kind of in our little shop about the fact that we're only a few days away from our Dog Nation cruise on board Allure of the Seas. And so many of our folks can get a chance to see that Oasis-class ship and all the fun stuff that it's associated with that. And really, uh, just a reminder to me to make sure I encourage all of you to have your own Royal Caribbean cruise vacation here in 2024. In fact, I still think about, you know, being at Perfect Day Coco Cay and the fun that goes on there. In fact, the last time I was there, I had a chance to be on board Icon of the Seas, the uh, largest cruise ship ever constructed. And really, you know, you think about the model that was the Oasis-class ship, you know, kind of adding to that and, and, and you know, creating some new ideas, some new neighborhoods, some new opportunities. That's really what Icon of the Seas was all about. And it's still amazing to me how many people come up to me and say, B8, so you were on Icon of the Seas? Tell me about that. Tell me what that was. It's amazing how much awareness there seems to be in the marketplace about just how cool Icon of the Seas is. And when you see it there on the video that you're watching, you understand why it's just such an amazing, amazing ship and uh, so much fun. And of course, when it comes to having fun on a Royal Caribbean cruise vacation, Jessica Slater, great travel agent to help you do just that. You can give her a call 770-718-9147. That's 770-718-9147. You can email her jslater at dreamvacations.com and all of the planning you need to make it a great 2024 for you on board a Royal Caribbean cruise ship, uh, including Icon of the Seas. Jessica Slater can tell you all about that. So check her out for more. All right, we got some fun stuff here. Now, I f- I'm actually fairly proud of myself here for a moment because we're kind of in f- fake tweet season. I know, I know they're it's called X now, but I still call them tweets. Uh, sort of fake tweet season where a lot of times you'll see some of these like viral, you know, account type things that'll put up co- quotes that are not real or they're kind of fake. I would say over the course of years, we've been pretty good about the fake quotes. I would say we've only gotten duped by a fake quote maybe twice. I know once at least, maybe twice. We're, we're pretty good about not getting duped by the fake quotes, but we've been duped before. So I don't want to be duped again. Anytime you see something a little bit too salacious from a player, sometimes you find out it's not actually real. And so I did a little due diligence on this, a little journalism. I dug deep to find out, was this quote accurate? Come to find out it was. I saw the video, so that confirmed it for me. Uh, Prince Uleman, former Florida pass rusher, now at Ole Miss, uh, pretty critical of his time at Florida. And stuff like this will always get a prominent mention here on our program. College football headlines of the account, which is sort of one of those accounts that sort of sounds fake, with all due respect to our friends at CMP headlines. But nonetheless, uh, Uleman was the number two overall defensive end in the transfer portal, was asked about, his skill set there at Ole Miss, and he says, here at Ole Miss, I feel like I'm getting coached harder than I was at Florida. At Florida, it was almost like they were just telling me to go out and use my talent. When I drive back into coverage of Florida, they would just tell me, go here, And but the coaches here at Ole Miss, they go into detail about what routes are being run. He says, I actually feel like I'm being developed here. So there you go. Not only is Florida not beating anybody of consequence, Billy Napier can't develop players either, According to a player that played for Florida, obviously that is really fun. And, of course, we enjoy making fun of the lousy, stinking Gators. But I do think there's another point here that probably is worth mentioning there, too. These days, everybody, for the most part, uses online reviews. You don't really stay in a hotel that you haven't researched. You don't really eat at a restaurant you haven't researched. I think we're about to enter into the kind of online review phase of college football because 
whether you like unlimited transfers or not, there are a lot of players who are essentially transferring an unlimited number of times, which is giving them a lot of comparisons and con contrastings with other football coaches. And I do think a lot of football coaches are about to see a lot of reviews for their performance out there in the wild. Someone like Princely saying, yeah, Florida, they didn't develop me at all. Compared to here at Ole Miss, I like it much better. That in the past, I think players kind of wondered, I wonder if another coach would be better for me. But now you don't have to wonder quite as much anymore. Now you have the actual comparison that you can make. And some coaches are not going to do well in that regard. And Billy Napier may be one of those. A couple of other stories here real quick. Uh, we talked yesterday about the fate of John Calipari at Kentucky. And it is now confirmed that Calipari will return in 2025. Uh, Mitch Barnhart confirming that yesterday, the Kentucky athletic director. Ultimately, what this comes down to is a very expensive buyout. But that doesn't change the fact that Kentucky fans right now are not too happy with the uh, situation there with the Wildcats and Calipari kind of in their crosshairs, but maybe just a little too expensive to buy out right now. So Calipari returns for 2025. I was going to do a story on Shador Sanders. Let me push that and save that for a, uh, another time because we've got something better to do right now. It's a Kroger Fresh Take as we welcome on Jake Fromm to the uh, program here today. And, of course, Jake – not able to be with us here last week. And now we have a little bit more information as to exactly uh, why that is. Jake, let me be among the first, at least publicly in a forum like this, to congratulate you on a uh, newly minted fatherhood here. You had uh, your son, Luke, uh, born last week. I felt bad. I called you. like, hey, Jake, can you be on the show tomorrow? <laughs> and you're like, well, B.A., I actually don't know that I can. I think I'm about to have a, a baby here. And so now that has happened. You shared those photos with the world on social media. I think we have a couple we can show here, too. What a, a beautiful Aww. child and a wonderful uh, thing that is. I uh, hope you don't mind us putting those out there, but uh, but a, just a great experience and a, a great family. So let me be among the first here to say congratulations on your uh, new family here. Uh, what a wonderful event. Yeah, Brandon, man. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, man, what an awesome experience. My wife is an absolute warrior. So glad women that, that God yeah. chose women to go through that and not men. Um, cause I didn't want any part of that. Uh, but man, we were so excited to have him here. Little Luke is awesome. Um, and, uh, yeah, both, both mama and baby are doing great. And, um, yeah, man, what a wonderful experience and, uh, just excited to be here. So do we have the baseball glove yet? Do we have the football yet? Do we have, because I, I, I know you're chomping at the bit as a dad to start, you know, you know, you know, getting that stuff going there. Uh, how much of that paraphernalia do we already have for the uh, young Luke? Yeah, we're, we're getting close. There's still a lot of things we, uh, we have to get, um, but we're trying to, to slowly mix, mix these things in. Like you said, you know, a little baseball glove here, throw the football around here and uh, make sure, you know, ha have the camo, you know, mixed yes. in. Um, so I, I'm, I'm trying to do well at, uh, make sure I'm picking out my outfits, you know, for him to wear and have the camo and the green and, and all that stuff. So, um, yeah, got, got to get daddy's fill in there too. Well, you know, by next week, 24 seven and on three, they're going to have a, a rating for, him. I'm not sure what class that'll be. I'm not smart enough to do the math on that, <laughs> but he's going to have a 24 seven rating or an on three yeah. rating, uh, within the next few yeah. weeks. You can pretty much assume that's the case, but in all seriousness, we are, uh, we're so happy for you and your family and such beautiful pictures. We love seeing that. We also love talking Georgia football with you there as well. One of the things we didn't get a chance to talk about last week, and we were just discussing there a moment ago is the fact that Georgia's got such an impressive home schedule in 2025. Kirby Smart was talking about that uh, uh, yesterday a little bit. And, you know, you played in the Georgia-Notre Dame game in 2019 and the excitement that existed there when Notre Dame came to Athens for the first time. Next year, you've got Texas coming to Athens for the first time. You've got Alabama coming to Athens for the first time in a long time. Uh, I know you've been busy thinking about your family, but when you think about big games like this, how exciting do you think it's going to be for Georgia fans to have – the sort of home games that, for whatever reason, just sort of seem to be few and far between sometimes, to have those big games coming in here to UGA, how big of a deal do you think that's going to be for Georgia fans knowing that you played in a game that was very much like that back during your Georgia career? Yeah, I'm pumped. I love it. Bring it on. You kind of alluded to it, mentioned to it. Like It feels like these big home games are few and far between for whatever reason. Um, but, man, the more we can get at home in our house – Bring it on. Like, I, that's such a, an awesome experience for the fans, for the players, everybody involved with the university. Uh, it's it's a win-win situation for everybody. You get to see good football. You get to see the best of the best. Um, and it, it brings out the best in everybody. You bring out the best in Kirby. Bring out the best in the players. And um, what a really cool experience for, for just the fans uh, involved. I, I always go back to that Notre Dame game and 
I mean, people were talking about, hey, can I can I stay here at your house for the Notre Dame game? And we're, we're in March. I'm like, <laughs> dude, you guys are already thinking about this? Like, holy cow, man, we're not even yeah. there yet. Uh, but it's a big deal. You got to gotta find those spots, figure out uh, all the logistics, um, and it just it makes for just an, an awesome weekend. We were talking about a Georgia offensive line a little earlier, Mike Morris, and when I look at the Georgia offensive line, I see an interesting situation. I'm guessing as a quarterback, you'd probably love it. You know, Micah seems like he's a really good player, and yet Dylan Fairchild, essentially the same position, is also a really good player too. And you've got, you know, depth at offensive tackle where a veteran like Truss is there, but a guy like Monroe Freeling may be pushing for playing time. You know, Ernest Green seems to have left tackle locked down. The point is, is that Georgia seemingly has more trusted, dependable offensive linemen than even the other kind of elite championship-type contenders. I mean, this is obviously an easy answer, but as a quarterback – how much do you love the fact that Georgia doesn't just have five offensive linemen, but you're talking about a second five that you probably feel pretty good about putting in the game and a rotational situation where you're getting a lot of experience for guys who are all sort of SEC worthy. How much easier does that make your job as a quarterback knowing that's the level of offensive line depth that Georgia seemingly has right now? Yeah, I mean, these guys mean the world to offensive play. I, I mean, and and how they're they're looked over or forgotten about and the whole offensive scheme just just blows my mind. If there's anything that I've learned about being in the NFL, like if you want to have success as an offense, like you live and die by how your offensive line plays on Sunday, right? If the offensive line can protect the quarterback, like everybody you know has a good quarterback, you, you allow him the, the chance to operate and, and, and throw good balls back there. Um, if, they, if they have a, a good physical presence, you can run the football and, and uh, you know clinch the game late in the fourth quarter. Um, so being able to have this kind of offensive line that they have, like guys they they can trust, they can lean on, um, and then also to have this competition that's going to bring out the best in everybody. So if you have guys who can play and guys who are competing for spots, man, that is a really, really good problem to have in that offensive line room. One of the guys we had a chance to hear from yesterday was Julian Humphrey, really good defensive back. And the story with Humphrey is, you know, a couple of months ago, this was a guy that we're led to believe was perhaps considering leaving the program, was going to transfer, certainly being pulled away by their programs, and ultimately chose to stay. And, Jake, here's what I'm curious of. In this day and age in which, you know, the transfer portal is a viable option for players, and in some cases it might be the right choice for players, but what does it say about a guy like Humphrey who chooses not to do that or Amarius Mims in the offensive line who, you know, a couple of years ago had a chance to do the same type of thing but chose to stay at Georgia and now may be rewarded as a first-round draft pick on the other side of this when someone, you know, doesn't take the easier route, you know, you know, stay here and compete and, and, and do what's hard and, and perhaps emerge as a better player for that. What does it say about a guy like Humphrey or other guys? Daniel Harris is kind of the similar situation. When they choose to stay and stick it out at a place like Georgia as a player yourself, what does that mean for you? Yeah, um, it just to me it means that you want to do things right. I mean, I think there's a variety of reasons to, to want to stay, obviously because one of, of Coach Smart and his track record, uh, the success of the program, what he can put you in, uh, potentially as far as a, an NFL career and, and in the NFL draft. Um, and, and to just, you love Georgia, you love the, the connections that it's going to bring you later in life. Um, and then you, you throw in this whole NIL and this, this pot of money that they get and these checks that they're getting week to week. And there's so many other reasons to stay and, and, and glad the young man chose to, to stay and, and compete and, and work hard. And um, I, I think he'll look back later in life and, and appreciate uh, maybe the, 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 tough situation he put himself in, the uncomfortable situation, the competing situation, uh, and know that that he's molding himself into becoming uh, man, a, a strong and confident young man. It's a, our Kroger Fresh Take with Jake Fromm here on Dog Nation Daily today. And, of course, if you want the uh, best that Kroger has to offer, one of the great things you can take advantage of right now is Kroger Boost. Now, especially if you're a new dad, because if you're a new dad, you know, you don't have time to maybe drive to your local Kroger to get all the stuff that you need. And when you're going through the the baby infant stage, you need a bunch. Uh, but perhaps you don't have time to drive over and get all of that. You can have that brought to you. Free delivery when you are a member of Kroger Boost. You can also take advantage of getting twice the fuel points every time you buy the stuff that you're already buying there at your local Kroger. So the membership opportunity from Kroger is a great thing for you right now. Check out Kroger.com slash boost. For more on that, it's Kroger.com slash boost for more on that. Jake, one more topic, then we'll let you go and get back to the uh, fatherhood duties here. We've heard a couple of interesting things from Georgia quarterback recruiting targets as of late. The other day, Julian Juju Lewis, who's a five-star class of 2025 uh, there at Carrollton, 
you know, his father was talking about the fact that they're looking very closely at Georgia right now to see what the quarterback room looks like. You know, does Georgia bring in another scholarship quarterback, a transfer, who would perhaps be someone that Juju would be competing with if he were to come to UGA? On the flip side of that, Georgia also just got a commitment from a quarterback from the class of 2026. That's two years away, but he's already seen enough from Georgia to say, yeah, I want to come to this program, presumably no matter what the quarterback depth chart looks, you know, over the course of the next 24 months. This is probably a little bit of a hard question for you to answer because your situation then may be different than it is now. But if you were a quarterback recruit here for this class of 2025 or 2026, you know, what all would go into your decision? How much of it would be about the NIL? How much would it be about the quarterback depth chart that's in place? How much would it be about certainly the coaching staff is going to be there? You know, the world is so different now than it was class of uh, 2017. How would you make your choice if you were a quarterback kind of coming of age right now? Yeah, um, I, to start off and, and clear the air there on that, there, there's so many other factors that are there now that I didn't have, you know, and, and how you decide to weigh those certain factors, you know, especially NIL and, and the transfer portal and, and where coaches are going and, and where they're going to pick guys up from. You know, have no idea. And how you're going to weigh that, I, I don't know. Um, for me, when I was coming out, I, I knew I, I wanted to be the best and I wanted to compete against the best. So I thought that place was was at, at Georgia and, and, and going to continue to be there. Um, and so we'll just kind of see what what these guys want want to do. And, and, and I, I, you know, but then again, I, I say this NIL stuff, it just completely throws a whole nother twist um, just in the whole recruiting game and yeah, I, I don't, I don't know, man. I, I don't know what, what kind of weight you put into that, and and what they're hearing, and what the numbers are like. And uh, man, I, I'm just glad I, I'm not a coach right now, having to to go and recruit and and do this because, man, this has just made things just significantly uh, more difficult. Well, it's an exciting week for your family, Jake, and we appreciate you sharing some of that with us here on the program today. Thank you so much for your time, and we'll of course look forward to having you back here as a part of a Kroger Fresh Take on Dog Nation Daily again very soon as well. Brandon, thank you very much. Great stuff, Jake Fromm there, and a wonderful family that he's uh, gotten to work on there, and uh, just a beautiful time and a, a great thing to be able to celebrate. We're also talking about Kroger there a moment ago and the stuff that you're always buying from your local Kroger. Of course, one of the things I'm looking to buy at Kroger all the time is Dr. Pepper. And, of course, we love having Dr. Pepper as a part of Dog Nation Daily. And as you're out shopping around picking up that Dr. Pepper, you can do just like me and enjoy the rich, one-of-a-kind flavor of Dr. Pepper all the time. We think about it a lot during the football season because – they're so well connected to the sport of college football, but it's also a great time to enjoy Dr. Pepper right now there as well. You head towards the Easter weekend, having plenty of that on hand for everybody who's going to be hanging out at your house and anything else uh, that you got going on. The great one-of-a-kind flavor of Dr. Pepper. It's a pepper thing. Make sure you try some today. And, of course, as we say goodbye today, as you would imagine, a lot of Georgia fans weighing in on the fun of seeing Georgia beat Ohio State last night, hearkening back to the Peach Bowl win because it was a last-second deal and a missed three at the end, uh, the symmetry there on that. I've gotten way too many of these to even show, but I want to give you a, a few of these. Our buddy Matt Dog, so good. How about the rendition here of Brutus Buckeye? That's what his name is, Brutus Brutus the Buckeye. He's crying. Mad Dog says, Ohio State missing out on three points to win the ball game against Georgia. Sounds familiar. Mad Dog, indeed it does. Really good for you. We'll give you a golden shoe there for that. Similar theme being struck here by a buddy, UGA Nation 412, who says Ohio State missing game, winning threes against Georgia. As time expires, it's really becoming sports comedy to, to me. Hashtag go dogs, hashtag NIT. Uh, and of course, throwing the uh, tag at me there as well. You love to see that. Another golden shoe here as well. Scott Moody writes in to say it wasn't midnight. But there was 1.2 seconds on the clock as Ohio State fails again on a uh, three-point opportunity. How about them dogs? Hashtag golden shoe. And I think I guess I didn't realize this. The same amount of time on the clock. How about that from the Peach Bowl? That's really good from Scott. I didn't quite realize that. But I did know everybody was obviously talking about this particular subject there last night. Georgia fans having a good time with all of that. Lousy, stinking Gators. Team can't win. Coach can't develop. It's been 1,236 days that they've beaten Georgia. And misery continues for them, for as far as our eyes can see into the future. Y'all have a great day. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Dog Nation Daily presented by Breda Past Management. And on video, time now for the R.S. Andrews Cool Down. R.S. Andrews, the one you turn to for your air conditioning, heating, plumbing, and electric needs. They will show up on time. They'll do the work that's promised, the price that's promised. 
You can trust R.S. Andrews on all of that today. We will get your comments. You want to make fun of Ohio State? We'll do that. You want to make fun of Florida? Of course, we are available to do that. You want to talk about something else from spring practice? Obviously, we'll be busy getting into all that for a uh, long time to come here. So a, a lot going on that. A little bit of talk there at dognation.com about the Joe Moore Award. It'd be nice to see Georgia be able to bring that home. We're still not quite so sure the criteria that Joe Moore Award seems to use for how it selects its offensive line, but obviously having best offensive line in the country, that'd be a pretty important thing for uh, Georgia here this year, and we believe that it's certainly a possible uh, outcome for these dogs. Uh, good to see Green Soldier in the comments section today. You always love that. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, apparently a little battling with G. Grace has oftentimes happened. Uh, CK3 also says Noah got ruggled, so there you go. A little bit of throwback to the Peach Bowl. You love that. Frederick Meredith says, if you live in North Georgia, Tennessee is probably your biggest rival. If you're from Midwest Georgia, it's probably Auburn. South Florida, it's the Lousy Stinging Gators. Yeah, there's a lot of geography that kind of gets determined in that. Even though for those folks who live over in like Augusta area, a lot of them don't like South Carolina. That is, you know, there, there is a lot of that that goes on. There is a lot of that that goes on. Um, let's see. Paul Moon says he also hates Tennessee. I would say Tennessee... Here's my theory about Georgia and Tennessee. Like, if you were to poll, you know, like however many Georgia fans you'd have to poll to make it scientifically significant. Um, If you were to poll Georgia fans on who's the rival that you hate the most, only a small percentage of Georgia fans would say Tennessee. But if you had a way of measuring intensity, the Georgia fans who hate Tennessee – Hate Tennessee so bad. It is not a large number. You know, you know, there's, you know, sort of spread out numbers in terms of who hates who and who whatever else. The number of people that that hate Tennessee is smaller in number. In fact, there's plenty of people kind of probably outside the bubble of Dog Nation that perhaps don't even think of Georgia Tennessee as even being being a rivalry. Um, but for the Georgia fans who say they hate Tennessee, y'all. The degree to which they hate Tennessee is intense. And so uh, you can certainly see that. Let's see what else. Um, Let's see what else is going on. Uh, Frederick Meredith says he'll be watching as many Kentucky games as possible to see what Brock Vandergriff's going to do. Yeah, I like Brock. I like Brock as a player. I always like Brock in high school. I just think that I think that he can be good. Um, I think that he was, like a lot of players at Georgia, in a tough spot. Now, there's a difference between quarterback and other positions, too. It's like, you know, Georgia's cross-training so-and-so at star and so-and-so at cornerback and so-and-so at safety. It's like you got a lot of ways to be on the field if you're a defensive back, for instance. And Georgia has like five of them on the field at most times. Sometimes they even have six, but there's five of them a majority of the plays, and there's always at least four. So that's a lot of time to play. Quarterback, you play one at a time. And oftentimes, you only play just the the way the game operates. You kind of only play one quarterback most of the time. Uh, And so there's obviously going to be more quarterback transfers than other positions. So Vandergriff found himself in a tough spot at Georgia, chose to utilize the portal to give himself a chance to play. For the most part, we think that's how the portal is supposed to operate. And I probably... To the extent that his interests don't, you know, uh, conflict with mine, I probably will be rooting for Brock Vandergriff. I, I will. I mean, I, I kind of like, you know, Georgia high school players, you know, guys that I saw in high school. Uh, I just, there's, I, I, I think there's a lot to like about Brock Vandergriff and continue to root for him. Unless he's playing Georgia, is something I'll do. Let us see. Uh, Crow King says, big weekend for baseball. Let's see if we can steal a game or two from Tennessee. Only thing we've got to prove is we can win on the road in a ridiculously loaded SEC. Yeah. I mean, obviously, better competition, you would assume, Tennessee compared to, to Kentucky. What you don't want is a non-competitive weekend. And unfortunately, against uh, a, a Kentucky a couple of weekends ago, other than like you know a couple of innings to start on Friday, it was essentially a non-competitive weekend for Georgia. I, I, I like your point here. I don't necessarily need you to take two of three on the road. Um, 
from Tennessee. I don't necessarily need you to do that. You know, what I'd love to see you do is get me a win prior to Sunday. Can you win either Friday or Saturday? You know, that would be a big deal for me. Go into Sunday with a chance to win the series. That would be a big deal for me. I don't need you to, I don't necessarily need you to win the series to do what you need to do. And I did see um, a guy named Kendall Rogers. He's probably the number one college baseball reporter that's out there right now. And his version of like baseball bracketology, he did have, I think, Georgia the first team out in his NCAA field uh, that came out last week. So to give you an idea of the depth of the SEC, you know, a team like Georgia right now is not even, you know, a given to be in the NCAA tournament. Obviously, if it continues to play well, it will be. Um, but uh, but right now, Georgia's probably got some work to do to be, you know, included in the field. Um, but, you know, getting something done in Knoxville will be a good way to, towards doing that. doesn't have to be two of three, but can you win Friday or Saturday and give yourself a chance on Sunday? That would, I think, be a pretty good thing. Um, Daniel Denny uh, taking a little bit of a jab at uh, at Curtis because Curtis had a bad game against Prince Avenue. Prince Avenue, y'all, that's a different kind of sort of low population private school. It just is. That's a different type of deal. And, I, I, you know, you're not the first one to bring up the fact that Curtis did not play well. Curtis, who would have been a sophomore in high school, uh, Tennessee high school football is no comparison to Georgia high school football. So you're talking about like sort of, you know, low pop private school in Tennessee playing a low pop private school in Georgia. It's just a different type of deal. And Prince Avenue is a machine right now. And so I don't, I, I really don't put much stock in that. A, it's a couple of years away before even, you know, going to be a college player as it is. And uh, Prince Avenue is pretty loaded. You know, Prince Avenue uh, obviously been famous for sort of the quarterback play for a while, you know, Brock, then uh, Aaron Philo, but they're more, you know, they're that. Let me see if I can speak and use English here for a second. They've got more depth and quality players at all positions, both sides of the ball now than they used to. There are going to be a lot of private school teams that are not going to be able to tussle with Prince Avenue. That's just, that's just a fact. So I don't put much faith in that. In fact, there were a good number of people that a couple of years ago when Brock, at Prince, played against uh, Gunnar Stockton at Raven County, uh, they didn't think that Brock played very well. And I basically said the same thing then that I'm saying now, is that at the time, Raven County had a lot more than Prince did. Uh, Raven County's just a better team. And some of the stuff that we do in a situation like this when we evaluate quarterback, and it's probably human nature can't help but do this, but the quarterback on the better team always looks like the better quarterback. And, you know, there's obviously ways to evaluate beyond just that. Um, so Curtis against Prince in kind of a blowout type loss, all that tells me is is that in this particular case, Curtis was playing on a, you know, much lower caliber team. Uh, let me go to the other comment sections for a moment. Let me see what's happening over here. On the Dog Nation Facebook page, On Facebook. Uh, Keith Folds in the comment section here today. Uh, Johnny Prescott says, I thought the dogs were sunk last night when the uh, uh, Ohio State finally grabbed a 75-74 lead, erasing another large late-game UGA lead. The team made some huge shots, got just enough stops to advance. Yeah, probably playing, you know, uh, I realize this is, you know, small consolation. They're probably playing the best basketball last couple of games. Road road stops at Wake and Ohio State, two places they are pretty pretty significant underdogs. They probably played better in both these stops than almost any games really this season. So, you know, that's not really what you want to hear. You want the games during the regular season that could have provided you a better postseason opportunity to to matter more. But, you know, it's not nothing to be playing a little bit better here right now. And, you know, I do take something from the fact that this team w seemed to want to keep playing, that that there seems to be a level of motivation around the program right now, which is not bad. Ryan Walker says he's going to come to Facebook. I am here now, Ryan. I'm sorry. 
Uh, Marshall Fleming says, first show I've missed live in years. We got hit with it. Oh, no. Uh, this is got hit with a tornado last night. Marshall, I'm so sorry to hear that. So sorry to hear that. I hope everything um, sounds like he's got a lot of damage. Marshall, I'm very sorry. Very sorry indeed. Uh, keep us updated on that, Marshall. I'm sorry to hear that. Brian Buttry mentioning a class of 2027 prospect, LaDamian Guyton. This is a 15-year-old man from Savannah Christian, of course, the same school that's producing Elijah Griffin there too. So uh, it's amazing how much the overall level of high school football play in the Savannah area has improved. It's amazing, really. Um, Bill Sanders says he wants to he wants to sweep Tennessee. So there you go. Um, uh, yeah, Michael Castleberry, Lucy Bowers, Boykin, also sort of weighing in on the Tennessee hate topic. Matt Rukavina says Tennessee's got the mouth of Ohio State and the trophy case of Vanderbilt, which is very funny. Um, uh, Michael Casper also says, if you go live in Tennessee, you'll hate them for sure. He goes, I live in Texas now. I need an anti-UT shirt to uh, cover both schools, which is very funny. Um, <laughs> Philip Jordan Wells, who's now back over on the uh, Facebook side, making fun of the typical banner on YouTube. Keith Folds, looking forward to the Dog Nation cruise. Keith, I am right there with you on that. Um, oh, how about Ryan Walker? He got two great guests in his podcast. He's got Steve Weiss, who I've always loved. Steve's great. And then, um, and then it says, then tomorrow you got uh, uh, his uh, godfather, Clarence K., the uh, great former Denver Bronco, part of those jo- part of those early John Elway teams that were making Super Bowls, and of course, a former dog. Um, and, of course, Ryan, I'd love to be on your show at some point in time. That'd be great. Um, <clears throat> maybe uh, let, let me get to this, this baseball season with my son because I feel like I'm doing that every night right now. But uh, but we can we can make that happen probably for sure, Ryan, for you, anything. For you, anything. Um, Daniel Denny says Tennessee fans, they haven't won the SEC in 26 years. Yes, this is what's, what, what gets weird is some of this stuff – Start, you know, for a long time they were making fun of Georgia for 1980, but then when Georgia starts winning, all of a sudden now you look around, you're like, oh gosh, 1998 was a long time ago. Like, I mean, hold a picture of yourself up 1988, 1998, and hold it up now. I mean, that's a long time ago, folks. Uh, and then you know, Florida's same deal when it comes to like 2008, 2006 there as well. Uh, Green Soldier says, if you want to make uh, Tennessee fans really upset, just mention they only have two uncontested titles. The rest they claim. So there you go, uh, Green Soldier. I like that. Christy, it's good to see you in the comment section. Sounds like you're checking out. Uh, checking out, I mean to say. Sounds like you're checking out. So uh, have a great day. Um, Philip Wells, back over here on YouTube on the subject of where Tyke Smith can be drafted, maybe third, fourth round. We'll see. Certainly he seemed to help himself when it comes to that uh, – that 40 time during the uh, during during the pro day stuff. Alan Verbonchik on Facebook says Florida is a dumpster fire. Tennessee is also. Uh, Craig Jones heading out on a cruise. So uh, Craig, enjoy yourself, and we'll get you on board one of these Royal Caribbean cruises here sometime soon. Uh, Matthew Goobin says I'm enjoying George basketball. Listen, college basketball is a really fun sport, and you know using it as like a springboard to kind of like further your football rivalries and your football trash talk. That's sort of part of the fun there too. So uh, I am very happy about all of that. And I'd love to have more of that in my life. I really would. And like, you know, a couple of minutes ago, we just had kind of a fun conversation about Georgia baseball. You know, unfortunately in the history of this show, which dates back now, you know, 2015, we haven't really had much justifiable reason to have the other sport conversations unless we were just sort of trying to force it onto the show. So now we have a situation where more of the, you know, teams may give us more, you know, significant reason to talk about them, which would be fun. And I said this, I used to get all kinds of criticism for mentioning another team from another sport. I don't seem to get as much of that, and I don't put a whole lot of stock into, you know, a small number of statements anyway. But maybe we're kind of turning a corner in which maybe people aren't so, like, repulsed by the idea of even a couple of minutes worth of something other than football. 
Uh, Miriam Corbin also reminds us, if weather permitting, you got Braves tomorrow afternoon in Philadelphia. I know they're concerned. Um, they're a little bit concerned about weather there, but I uh, hope to get that in tomorrow afternoon. Spencer Strider now the opening day starter for the Braves. Strider versus Wheeler. It seems like it, it seems like you don't have a ton of like the classic opening day ace versus ace type uh, matchups always anymore. But Strider versus Wheeler, an example of that, as Miriam said, uh, we do not like the Phillies. Uh, it's always a mis- interesting to me that a lot of you know Georgians have semi adopted the Eagles because of all of the uh, you know former UGA players the Eagles have, but that goodwill does not extend to all of Philadelphia. Because we hate the, the the Phillies as bad as ever. And a very, very bad taste left over from last year's playoff loss. Randy, y'all asking me if I saw Iron Claw. I, I was actually thinking about this yesterday. I still have not seen that movie, Randy. Uh, PDT says, did you see South Carolina Ole Miss girls basketball game? Defensive player fell on the ground. Someone stepped on her hair uh, and snatched her. Oh, wow. Uh, all the girls surrounded her to protect her from the uh, – Cameras, uh, good gracious, um, sounds like a rough situation. I did not see that. I did not see that. Uh, Frogger, so Frogger of the day, Frogger 2000 said that he is from Louisiana, which is obviously where uh, ATN is well. And he says they would be pronounced ATN. But Frogger, even if that is like the, the local pronunciation, I mean, like I had people tell me that the family, like the, like the ETN family still says ETN. Even if like the the sort of geographic pronunciation would say ATN, I mean you know because you're from Louisiana and they are too. But man, I had I had people tell me that. Um, I don't know. I get stressed out about these pronunciations. The same thing with like a Rick Gilbert and a Rick Gilbert. I had so many people were like, man, I'm telling you right now. Like I'm talking about people who would know. Like like people who are like fairly close to the process. They're like reaching out privately. Listen. I'm here to tell you it's a reek. And then somebody else is like, no, it's Eric, like the name Eric. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. Ugh. Like some of these pronunciations stress me out because people keep saying different stuff. Um, yeah, Roger Hall. What's uh, <laughs> out like the the acronym E-T-N. Uh, uh, but maybe that's just something that fans invented. Um, Roger Hall, on the subject of the Iron Claw, says, I'm not a huge fan of pro wrestling, but the Iron Claw movie reignited some interest for me. I'm telling you right now, wrestling is red hot right now. The The buildup for WrestleMania has been as good as anything they've done in a while. Uh, all of the stuff with, like, Rock and Cody and uh, Roman Reigns and, you know, Seth Rollins being involved in that kind of stuff, too. Um, uh, by the way, Frogger 2000 says, what does the family know? He goes, I've, I got three f- uh, friends with the same last name. They all call it ATN. So there you go, Frogger. I appreciate that. Uh, but the, if, if, if you're kind of a lapsed wrestling fan, and I'm, this is not an ad. I'm just telling you person to person. If you're kind of a lapsed wrestling fan, the buildup to WrestleMania has been outstanding. It's been outstanding. So do with that what you will. Let's see what else. Uh. Anything else before we go? G. Gray says he's too good to watch the XFL. Well, there you go, G. Uh, Pardon us for having some fun. But also, like, here's the, the thing, and this shouldn't need to be said. But part of what makes the Georgia, like, mocking of Ohio State so enjoyable is the fact that it is only the NIT. Like, that's kind of like part of what makes it fun is the fact that this is just something we chose to make a big deal out of just because it was a Wednesday night. What else are you going to do? Or Tuesday night. What else are you going to do? That's part of what makes it fun. Um, UGA boy for life. Brunetti says the older I get, the less I watch wrestling. So I'm kind of the same way, but what I've discovered is because I'm maybe older than you are. I don't know. Um, so as I got older, I started watching it less, but then when something interesting would happen, I'd sort of gravitate back in. And so what I really am is a little bit like a lot of people are. And if you can, if you see the rating is kind of like this. It's like if it gets bad, I'll sort of drift away. If it gets good, I sort of drift back in. And, you know, not everybody's like that. And, frankly, listen, you, know, you can do what you want. Um, but if you are the kind of person who, uh, you know, sort of drifts in and drifts out, I would say right now is a is, is a time worth drifting in on. I would say that. Um 
Yeah, CK3, uh, G. Gray says he wasn't watching the NIT. I wonder if he was watching college baseball last weekend because I saw that. I saw that. Uh, Derek Lewis says, what a great wedding anniversary gift it would be when UGA whips Bama. I tell you right now, Derek, that's a good anniversary indeed. Uh, that would be a good anniversary indeed. Uh, Stick D says, what are we going to be doing for the Dog Nation for the G-Day game? Uh, we'll have regular game day coverage for sure. Going to be live, of course, uh, on on hand for all of that. And uh, looking forward to some fun there on that. So we'll give you more details about that in the days ahead. All right, anything else? We're getting ready to go here. Randy also says, how about the build-up of pro arm wrestling? So when I was, I mean, I saw Over the Top when I was a kid, the movie, of course. And for a while on ESPN, arm wrestling was a thing, uh, but I saw the movie over the top. I'd say that was probably a little forced. Uh, probably didn't like that one quite as much as some of the other uh, uh, classic Sylvester Stallone movies, but I'm going to be lying if I said I didn't also watch it either. Uh, so there you go. All right. Um, we have got to go for now, though. Y'all check out RS Andrews online, rsandrews.com, for your air conditioning, heating, plumbing, and electric needs. They show up on time. They do the work that's promised, the price is promised. You can get your air conditioning tuned up, ready to go for the spring and hot weather season that's on its way. You can do that, and it may only cost you $99. Somebody's told you that you need some, need a new unit one of these days you might, but for now you may be able to find out you can get some old life or some new life out of your old unit. So find out more about that online, rsandrews.com. Y'all have a great day. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Dog Nation Daily, presented by Breda Pest Management. We'll look forward to talking to you then, everybody.